book of Hosea. That's going to be between the books of Daniel and Joel. So if you will, turn to the book of Hosea. We will be in chapter 10 this morning. Hosea chapter 10. We just finished up the book of Romans, and so I've got a few sermons that are just kind of individual one-hitters that I want to uh, preach before we get started in another study through another book of the Bible, and uh, that will probably be starting at the end of March, beginning of April. And so um, the book of Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, it reads, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of this land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. For now, they say, we have no king. Because we did not fear the Lord as for a king, what would he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of beth Aven, For its people mourn for it, and its priests shriek for it, because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jareb. Ephraim shall receive shame. And Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Assyria, her king is cut off like a twig of the water. Also high places of Avon, the sins of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gebeah. That There they stood, the battle of Gebeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. But it is my desire, I will chasten them. Peoples shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two transgressions. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain. But I will harness her fair neck and I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord. Till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way. In the multitude of your mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall rise among your people. And all your fortresses shall be plundered. As Shalman plundered Beth Arbel in the battle of the day. A mother dashed in pieces upon her children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness at the dawn of the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for loving us, for blessing us, Father, for holding us close to your side. We thank you for your word as it's been preserved and passed down so many generations, Father, standing as a direction, as a guidebook to us, Lord, that we can see what faithful men and women of the past have done, Father, how you visited them, how you've preserved them, how you've kept them and directed them. And Father, we can learn from those examples, Father, but not just from your holy word, but also now, Father, we enjoy your Holy Spirit. Father, that is entwined and engulfed in each one of us, Father, to discern right and wrong, to teach us the truths of your word, to convict us of our sins, and Father, to lead us in your paths of righteousness. Father, that's what we ask for today, that you would teach us, that you would convict us, and Father, that we would leave here more like your son, Jesus. Father, able to share your gospel, to shine your light into this dark world in which we live, to our loved ones, our co-workers, our families, our friends, Father, the strangers that we encounter every day, that, Lord, that we could be about the business of expanding your kingdom, of glorifying your name in every way. Father, this we pray only because of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood. Amen. So the book of Hosea is where we're going to be today. This is a, a uh, very interesting book. Hosea was a very interesting prophet. He's one that uh, God uh, came to Hosea to be a prophet, and there he told the prophet to marry a prostitute. And so Hosea goes about, and he marries a 
prostitute. Now, the story is in the first three to four chapters of the book of Hosea. And, uh, and then after those first three to four chapters, then we get a, a girth of prophecy for the remaining you know, ten or so chapters. And so Hosea marries this prostitute, and he has a multitude of children. He had, well, he has three children. And those three children, their names kind of give us some insight. The first one basically means justice or, you know, I'm kind of getting what I deserve. And then the second child, he names, well, I'm not real sure if that's my kid or not. And then the third child, he says, well, I don't even love this kid. And those three names go to as a portrait and the marrying of a harlot goes to the portrait of God marrying Israel and Israel's response to God's love, to God's affection, to God's leadership. That Israel rejects God and they get what they deserve. And then they go wayward and they begin to serve all kinds of false gods around them. And God says, I don't know if those are my people or or not. They bear my name, but they sure don't look like it. They don't act like it. They don't seem like it. And then lastly, he goes, well, you know, I don't know if I love them or not. They don't love me. I'm pouring out my love towards them. But all I get in return is is, uh, people desecrating my name, is people using my resources and enjoying my blessedness, but no return, no admiration, no love, no joy whatsoever. And then he promises that he will redeem them. And the same with the prophet Hosea, his wife, the prostitute. She runs off. She returns to a life of prostitution as he's taking care of these three children. And then he learns after some time that now not only has she gone back to prostitution, but she's also being sold as a slave prostitute. And guess what Hosea does? He takes his money and he goes down to the slave auction And he purchases his wife who has left him for harlotry. The one that he rescued, the one that he preserved, the one that he brought out and gave a better life to, that then rejected him, that then turned away from him to go back into a life that she had been rescued from. Here Hosea returns to rescue her once again from that lifestyle, from that brokenness. It's a beautiful, beautiful story right here. And it all parallels into God's relationship with his people. And so in chapter 10, I I picked that out particularly because I thought it was kind of pivotal in the story. And so in chapter 10, he begins and God uh, has told them of their judgments, has told them of their wickedness, has told them of all of the problems and all the things that he was punishing them for, all the things that had separated them from him and his love and his righteousness. But then in chapter 10 is where we get the diagnosis of what had happened. He starts off in chapter 10. He says, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars. Now, these aren't altars to God. These are altars to Baal. These are, this is false worship. He says, according to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their hearts divided. Now they're held guilty. He, God, will break down their altars. God will ruin their sacred pillars. He gives us a diagnosis of what started to go wrong in the life of God's people. And he says, what started to go wrong was that everything was going right. What started to go wrong in Israel was that everything was going right. Israel had lived lives where they had been conquered, they'd been oppressed, they had been constantly planted crops just to have the crops grow up, to then have invading armies come in and steal the crops, leave them destitute, not knowing how they were going to make it through the winter. And now all of a sudden, a a season of prosperity had come into the people of God and the people of God had spent so much time and so much energy into their own prosperity that now their prosperity was working against them. When it was struggle time, it was God time. And when it was struggle time, God's people turned to God and said, Lord, how are we going to make it? Lord, what should I do? Lord, you save us. Lord, you care for us. Lord, you guide us. But man, when prosperity came, when there was more money than there was month, when there was more in the checking account than there were bills in the mailbox, then all of a sudden God got pushed to the side and God got pushed out the door. And all of a sudden Sundays were for something else and, and nightly dinner time wasn't about God and his blessing and his 
God's provision, but we thank, we thank ourselves for all the things that we've produced, and we've forgotten the one who blesses us. And in each and every one of our lives, that's the case. When things are going right, that's when things are about to go wrong. And when everything is good and when we're all blessed and, man, we all have our, our bills paid and our mortgages are, are up and, man, we're doing everything good and the cabinet is full of food, there often is where we'll forget who's blessed us. And we'll put our eyes on the blessing instead of on the blesser. We'll begin to trust in ourselves and we'll think that we did this and that it wasn't God who gave us the ability to obtain wealth, but that somehow it was our own genius. It was our own industriousness. It was our own creativity that did this. And we forget that God is the author and he is the sustainer, not only of our faith, but of our life itself. That breath that you just breathed was upon the mercies of God. The reason that you woke up this morning is because of the mercies of God. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and when you begin to go to work, guess what? That is all because of the mercies of God. Because there is an enemy who wants to still kill and destroy you. There is an enemy who wants to send you, your kids, your grandkids to an eternal pit of fire. That he wants to direct your love and your attention away from the one true God and upon anything else. And it's only because of the grace of God that he awakened you, that he called you to be his own, that he strengthened you with the knowledge to be able to make that decision to follow the one true God. It's so often for us to become full of ourselves and empty of God. So he shows us here that the first thing that went wrong with the people of God is that things were just going too good. For many of us, we don't know what hunger is. And even when we've gotten poor and we've gotten destitute and we've gone through hard times there was always something in the kitchen may not be what you wanted but there was something in the kitchen for many of us when we say there's no food in the house what we say is what we're really meaning is there's not anything that that pleases my appetite at this moment we'll go in there and we'll dig through cans and cans of food we'll open the freezer and look at all the food in the freezer and go there ain't nothing to eat in this house and then we'll go to the grocery store and we'll fill the buggy full of, you know, uh, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars worth of food. And then as we pay for it and we exit the grocery store, what do we do? We stop by a restaurant and get something because we don't want to go home and cook nothing. We are so blessed. We are so outrageously blessed that we don't even realize how blessed we are. Our trash cans are fuller than most people's houses in this world today. And we throw away and we waste more than most people have in this world today. And in that prosperity, what has happened to the United States of America? We've forgotten our God. And we've gotten our eyes off of the blesser off of why we have freedom, why we have liberty, why we have this prosperity. We've forgotten our foundation, and we've begun to look out there and find other things that we can fill our lives with. Things that are empty, things that are unfruitful, things that ain't got nothing to do with the good times that you're going through right now. And we'll run to the theater, we'll run to the ballpark, we'll run to whatever leisure activity that we want to run to, and we'll forget the God who allows us the prosperity to be able to engage in those things. The first thing that went wrong with Israel was that everything was going all right. That he multiplied his fruitfulness, and as his fruitfulness multiplied, guess what? His altars multiplied too. He started looking at what else can he bring into his life. What else can take time and attention and affection away from the one true God? What else can I fill this free time with because I'm not struggling every moment just to get by? It says, according to the bounty of his land, they embellished his sacred pillars. Not only did he make altars, but he also made them prettier. He spent time just making the false gods of his life more attractive and more satiated. And then he looked upon God's covenant in verse 3 and verse 4. And he says, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. For as a king, what would he do for us? In other words, what am I getting out of this following this God? 
What am I getting out of this salvation? What am I getting out of this routine? What am I getting out of, of, of this obedience to God? He says that they swear falsely in making a covenant. I tell you, today in the American church, there's a lot who have sworn falsely in making a covenant. They say they're Christians, but they're simply not Christians. They may occasionally fill the house of the Lord, but it's just to make mama and them happy. It's just to appease somebody else. They don't come into the house of God for worship. They don't come into the house of God for correction. They don't come into the house of God for instruction. They just come in the house of God to keep somebody quiet. And so they swear falsely in making a covenant. And so when they come into the house of the Lord, and even if they stay, and even if they spend time in the house of the Lord, what they don't do is spend time with God. And the house of the Lord begins to be bastardized, and it becomes not what God's word says, and not what God's word ordains, but rather what their own opinion prefers. And they'll change what God has said to what they think. And they'll say, yeah, I know the Bible says, but I feel, well, what you feel is wrong. Because your heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? Because God alone is true and everyone else has found a liar. So if your opinion doesn't come from the word of God, if it's not based upon the word of God, and if it's not congruent with the word of God, it's wrong. And you'd be a fool to follow it. Let us never swear falsely in making a covenant. If we say that God is our God, let him be your God. You serve him, you follow him, you do what he says, you answer his call, you perform exactly what he has called you to, you uh, express everything in this life according to his definitions, according to his design, or just quit calling yourself a Christian. Quit swearing falsely. Quit saying, yeah, I'm just like Christ. I believe in Christ. Jehovah is my God but I'm just going to do what I want to do. You can't have it the same way. Either Jesus is Lord or he's not. Either Jesus is king or he is not. And you must decide who you will follow, whether to be the one true God or whether to be the one lying you. And he says, the inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of Beth-Avon. Beth-Avon means the house of wickedness. And that calf is bell worship. Now, what was Baal worship? Well, pretty much they had three false gods that Israel always dealt with and that they always had to uh, um, repent from. And those three false gods was, the, was basically war, violence. It was sexual immorality, and it was just pure greed. And Baal worship was always about more. That was it. People worshiped Baal because they wanted more. And they thought that here what God had given them wasn't enough. And instead of looking at God as the one who has blessed them, they turned, they looked at Baal, and they said, I just want more. I want my senses tingled. I want everything satisfactory. I just want more of this good stuff. And so in that, they would do anything that Baal wanted. They would do all manner of evil and ridiculousness if they thought that it would give them a little more. If they thought that they could just increase a little more. And what that quest for a little more brought them to was a house full of wickedness. A house full of wickedness. Today, Americans' homes are full of wickedness. And many of America's churches are full of wickedness. Why? Because we don't follow what God says, we follow what we want. We don't follow what God says is pleasurable, what God says is good, and what God says is holy, but rather what the world says is fun, what the world says is entertaining, and what the world says that we should want. And we've swapped the definitions of the one true God for the definitions of one lying world. And even in doing so, look what happened to the people of Samaria as they gave themselves over to the worship of more, as they allowed themselves to participate in the house of wickedness. Look what happened in verse 5. It says, its people mourn for it. They mourn over it. And even the priests shriek for it. They're just a bunch of screaming preachers promoting filthiness. 
And why? Because its glory has departed it. The idol shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. They thought that they could just dip their toe in a little. They thought that maybe I'll just try this. I'm going, to keep my, I'm going to keep my Christianity, but I'm also going to go over into this worldliness. I'm going to keep these Christian things, but I'm going to do what the world says. I'm going to do what mama and granddaddy taught me, and I'm going to do these things that are good and holy. I'm going to continue to go through the motions over here, but I'm going to see if this over here has something to offer. I'm going to see if there's something fruitful, if there's something that is good that I can reap out of this ungodly world. World. And you know what happened? It brought mourning. And even with the priest, the priest would scream and shout and shriek. Why? Because the glory had departed from it. Because the glory of sin had departed from it. You know, friends, sin, sin is fun for a season. And you can dip into sin and you can have fun for a little while until your chickens come home to roost. Until the penalty comes due. Until all of a sudden the consequences of your disobedience to God begin to reign true. Until that sin becomes stale. Until all of a sudden that's not good anymore. That's not enough anymore. And you'll crave more and more and more of it. And the depravity of sin will take you deeper and further than you ever thought that you would go. And you'd always say, well, I'd go this far, but I wouldn't go no further. I'd do that, but I ain't going to do this over here. And before you know it, you're doing exactly what you said you would never do. Why? Because the glory of sin fades off. And all it can do, all it leaves you with, is screaming for more and mourning what you've already done. Ashamed of where you've been, and at the same time, questing and wanting more. No drug addict has ever, taken, uh, has ever done drugs one time and said, that's enough. No fornicator ever fornicated once and said, you know what, that's good enough. Nobody ever engaged in, in some filth or some wretchedness and said, you know what, that, that's enough, that's far enough. Nobody ever listened to some ungodliness on the radio and said, you know what, I'll never listen to another song. It always quests to take you further. It always brings you to the point where you're ashamed of what you've done, but you just can't stop doing it. Sin gets old and stale, it gets boring, and it must progress and it must pervert to stay interesting. And if we engage in sin, that's what we'll end up progressively more perverted. Deeper in sin than we ever thought. Doing things that we never thought we would do. Allowing things that we never thought we would allow. And that we'd be ashamed for people to know the truth about. And it says that in this sinfulness and in this swearing falsely to a covenant, in this fakeness, this pretending of using God's blessedness for sinfulness, it says that judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. If you go out and right now it, it's planting season and we're all getting ready with our gardens and you know the tillers are working and we're going through and everybody's stopping to browse the, the seed selection at the, at the co-op or the various hardware stores and everybody's looking and you're thinking about what can you plant? What are you going to grow this season? And if you went out right now and if you tilled up that garden and if you got ready but then you didn't do nothing with it, then what are you about to grow? Bunch of weeds. A bunch of weeds. And for very many of us, that's exactly where we are in our spiritual life. We tilled it up. We got ready. We thought we had a bunch of I'm going to's. The same as we do every year. You know, at New Year's, we make a bunch of pledges and promises and resolutions of what we're going to do. And you know what happens? The next year, we just make the same ones. I've been going to lose weight for about uh, 22 years now. This past year, I made a new resolution. I'm going to gain weight. So far, I've been successful. Just got to change your tactic, guys. That's all. And so if we go out and if we plow that garden and if nothing happens, if we don't continue on in that good work, do you know what's going to happen? Weeds. Weeds. Because if you fail to sow the right seed, some seed's going to take root. And if you fail to go forward, then you know what? Things are going to take its place. 
And in those furrows and that plowed ground, as, it, as it's disked up and as it's turned up, there's the place for prosperity. There's the place for growth. There's the place for you to go further with God. But if you stop short and if you halt and if you uh, just pump the brakes, then guess what? You're going to get weeds. And here he says you're going to get hemlock. Hemlock is an extremely poisonous plant. You get hemlock in a cattle field, then you've got a bunch of hamburger on your, on your hands. Because it'll kill everything that eats it. If you happen to get out there in a hemlock field and are cutting it down and get it on your hands and, and wipe your brow or, or some of it, you know, some sweat runs into your mouth, guess what? You sick as a dog and you might die too. He said that we have to take this very seriously. The consequences are grave. The consequences are tremendously terrible upon those who start but who don't finish. He goes on and he tells us uh, another reason for the problem, another what went wrong. First, that first thing that went wrong was that everything was going all right. The second thing that went wrong was that they started looking to the world for their definitions and for what was desirable and what was good. The final thing, it says in Ephraim, uh, in uh, verse 11, that Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but harnessed. But I harnessed her neck, and I will make Ephraim pull a plow. There's a big difference between threshing grain and pulling a plow. Pulling a plow takes a team. And pulling a plow is hard work. And pulling a plow puts you out there in the, in the middle of the work, and, and man, it, it ain't fun. Now, threshing grain is great because guess what? Threshing grain is usually done in the shade. Threshing grain is just you. You can kind of do it at your own pace and do what you want and however you want to do because there's no accountability. There ain't nobody that you're hooked to. Ain't nobody that you're yoked up with. And you know what? There's no muzzle when you're by yourself. There's nobody to tell you, to, hey, you need to hush that up. You need to cut that out. You need to quit it. You need to get back to what's right. You need to quit saying that. That's wrong. There's nobody to muzzle that ox while it threshes the grain. And then just to keep you interested and to keep you going, then guess what happens with that old threshing heifer? Well, you give it a little taste of what it's threshing. You just keep it a little sa satiated. You keep it a little satisfied. You just allow it to do and say whatever it wants to say, just to keep it interested. You just keep it comfortable. The last thing that went wrong with Israel is that it was just too comfortable. And for us, we're just too comfortable. And man, you know, we have a life of ease. We have a life that doesn't involve a lot of labor and a lot of pain, a lot of hardship, and we're just comfortable. And when we get comfortable, guess what happens? This afternoon, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get in that recliner. You know what's going to happen about 30 minutes after I get in that recliner? Juanita's going to call me. And after I ignore Juanita's phone call, I'm going, to I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to take me a nap. I'm just a little too comfortable. And when we get comfortable, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get lazy. And then we're just going to start to slumber. That's what's happened to America, friends. We were too comfortable for too long. And we got lazy. And we started sleeping. And our culture has changed right around us. And, and the ungodliness has overtaken us. And you know why? Because we got lazy. Because we got lazy. Because we thought everything was good because we were comfortable. Because there was food in the pantry. Because our bank accounts kept increasing. And so we thought we could just lay back and we could take our hand off of the plow. And maybe we just go in a circle and we just kind of go through the, the mundane routine. And we get fed a little bit. And, and nobody's really muzzling us. And we don't even realize that we're being used. But we've been used for very long. And we've trusted things that we shouldn't have trusted. And instead of, uh, instead of Christians going to places of power and prestige in the government and, and turning things and maintaining things and keeping things on the path that God had placed in America, guess what happened? We got lazy, we got complacent, but evil never rests. Evil's always at work. So Ephraim, the problem, Ephraim became a trained heifer. Too many today, guys, we've become trained heifers. We just keep going in the circle. We don't want to do the hard work. 
We don't want to do the things that hurt and the things that are hard, the things that will make people talk bad about us if we do it, if we go a different way, if we have to plow up ground instead of just walking in a circle. People ain't going to be happy with you. And it ain't an easy road. But here God says, I will harness their fair neck or weak necks and he'll plow with them. He'll make Ephraim pull a plow. And he says in verse 12 of this hard work that here God will make us do the hard work and that here's our response. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord. Now here, these words, who are they directed at? This doesn't say that God will sow. It doesn't say that God will reap. It doesn't say that God will break up. Who does it say will do that? You. You. It's your job. That's on us. So he tells us, after God tells us to pull the plow, after God instructs us to do the hard work, after God tells us that this is the path that we are to trod, that is to get out of the circle, get out of the routine, to not be comfortable anymore, but to do the hard work, to go the hard way, that as we do that, what are we to do? We are to sow righteousness. We should sow righteousness for ourselves. Right now, each and every one of you know of a sin that you should repent of. Right now, you can all think of it. Why haven't we? Why did we come to the house of the Lord with sin that we knew we should have repented of? Why did we sit in his pews with sin that we knew that we should repent of? Why did we sing his praises while refusing to obey him? Why did we do that? Because we're comfortable. Because we're too blessed. Because we've just gotten lazy. He says, you sow for yourself righteousness. You know things that you ought to be doing, and you're not doing them. You need to. For the sake of your soul, for the sake of the souls of your friends, for the sake of the souls of your children, for the sake of the souls of your grandchildren, for the sake of the souls of your grandchildren that ain't even born yet, you sow for yourselves righteousness. You reap in mercy. You break up your fallow ground. Now, what's fallow ground? Fallow ground is ground that ain't been used for what it's supposed to be used for. Fallow ground is that field that, man, they used to grow crops over there, but they don't grow crops there no more. There used to be cattle on that ground. There ain't cattle on that ground no more. That used to be prosperous. That used to be fruitful. It ain't fruitful no more. Now they've allowed it just to sit. They've allowed the fences just to fall apart. They've allowed the, the weeds to invade and to grow up. And, and in that, it ain't good for much of nothing right now. It's just a big mess waiting to become a wilderness. Thorns and thistles and briars are all in there. And it ain't good for nothing. And God told his people to break up your fallow ground. For you to till the soil where you know you should be fruitful. The things that you know that you're supposed to be doing. The things that you know that you're supposed to be engaged in. Right now at this very moment, God calls you to break up your fallow ground. Where God has put something on your heart and you just ain't doing it. Where God's told you to teach a class and you ain't teaching. God's told you to start a ministry and you ain't ministering. God's told you to stop by that house and talk to that person and you just ain't done it. God's told you to repent of something. God's told you to do things and you just ain't doing it. And you know what? Your fruitfulness is on display or your lack thereof is on display. You got fallow ground. Each and every one of us do. And God says that that fallow ground, we very often will come up with a lot of excuses for that. And we'll come up with a lot of reasons why next year, oh, next year, next year I'm going to do that. Next year I'm going to get to it. Next year I'm going to engage in this. Next year I'm going to get started. God said, break up your fallow ground right now. Begin to do the things that you already know. Begin to be fruitful in the places that God once had you fruitful and now you're not fruitful anymore. The things that used to be productive that you're not producing anymore, God said, get productive. Get to producing, and you'll sow in righteousness. You'll reap in mercy when you break up your fallow ground. He says, for it is time 
to seek the Lord. Absolutely. In the day in which we leave, in which we live, guys, if you're not seeking God, you're being led astray. If you're not hearing the truth on a constant and continual basis, you are believing lies. You may not even realize what lies you're believing, but there's a father of lies who's the God of this world, and he tells them nonstop. And it says, we do this until he comes, that's God, until God comes and rains righteousness on us. We pursue righteousness, and we do all that we can until God shows up and rains righteousness down upon us. We engage in what we already know is right. We repent of the sins that we are aware of. We engage in the right things that God has instructed us in. And when God shows up, guess what? He's just going to rain righteousness down on us. The things that we don't know about, the things that we can't do, the things that we've fallen short of, that's where God rains righteousness down on us. And he says, because you've plowed wickedness, we've reaped iniquity. We've eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted your own win, your own way. You thought you had it figured out. Thought you'd found a better way. You weren't going to be closed-minded like all them Christians from them years ago. Somehow we discovered some secret code to the Word of God that meant that we didn't have to obey Him. That's taught in a lot of churches, friends. That's written in a lot of false books that's sold by Lifeway. And it says, in the multitude of your mighty men, and he says, therefore, a tumult shall arise among your people. Your fortress shall be plundered as a shawman plundered Beth Arbel in the day of battle. He says, for us to be ready because hard times come and difficulty arises. And that instead of trusting in somebody else will take care of it. That'll be somebody else's business. This mighty man over here, he'll do it. This mighty man over here, he'll save my family. This mighty man over here, he'll put us back on track. This mighty man over here, he'll tell us what to do. Or instead of the fortress, look what we've built. We're safe here. Look, we've got all this stored. We've got all this prepared. And instead of trusting in our fortresses, instead of trusting in our mighty men, what do we do? We pursue God. We seek his righteousness. We don't trust our own way, our own wisdom, our own intelligence, or especially our own opinions, because they will lead us to plowing wickedness. They will lead us to reaping iniquity, and they will lead us to eat the fruit of lies. So this morning, friends, as we conclude, let us not trust our own fruitfulness. Let us not use our prosperity as a, as a unction to forget the one who prospered us. Let us always keep our eyes on the blesser and never on the blessings. Let us never become distracted by how good things are going. Let us also never become so comfortable that we forget that there's hard work to do. We stand blessed and we stand as a wonderful nation, but we stand there because of the hard work that we're done by amazing men that God put to work, who put their hand to the plow and were not content simply to just go in circles and just get fed a little bit. Let us never be comfortable, never, never let us get our eyes off of God, but let us always pursue Him. Let us always pursue His righteousness and let us break up our own fallow ground where we've gotten comfortable, where we've gotten lazy, where we've become unfruitful, let us once again be fruitful towards God. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for your word, as rich and full as it is. Lord, I thank you for men who stood faithful in generations past. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be those same faithful men in this generation. Father, that years from now that people will look back and they'll speak our name to your glory of our love for you, of our obedience to you, Father of how we did hard things instead of taking the comfortable, easy way. Father, of when we plowed instead of threshing. Father, where we planted and where we reaped and where we harvested. And Father, where we gave you the glory instead of sitting back on our own prosperity, thinking that we've done enough, we've gone as far as we can go, and that it's just time for rest. Father, we pray that we would work while it's still day. 
and we'll wait for that day where you'll take us home, that day of rest, that day of peace, Father, that's coming, but is not now. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We love you, Father, and we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Won't you stand?